Good evening. Welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium. My name is Jonathan Holtquist. I'm the manager of public programs. Uh, we have a wonderful evening planned for you tonight here. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, ocean pollution and uh, some of the emerging threats in our oceans. Now, some of you uh, may have recently seen uh, news about oil spills. Um, uh, uh, right here in Vancouver and Broad Inlet, we had uh, an oil spill last week that's kind of uh, caught a lot of attention, uh, raised some awareness about um, our vulnerability to ocean pollution. Our speaker tonight is going to talk a little bit about ocean pollution in general, and then he's going to start to focus a little bit on some ocean pollution that most of us are probably not even aware of. So we've heard of oil spills, but this other pollution is called microplastics. And these are things that we cannot see. And it's an emerging threat. And it's something that I think we need to be very concerned about and aware about. Because this kind of thing can uh, bring contaminants uh, into the food chain. And uh, it's something that animals can actually consume. But our speaker tonight uh, will talk more about that. So our speaker is Dr. Peter Ross, the director of the Ocean Pollution Program here at the Vancouver Aquarium. Uh, a, a renowned expert in the field of ocean pollution. He's done a lot of work with marine uh, mammals, uh, including some fish and other critters in the sea, looking at uh, toxicology, the impacts of uh, flame retardants and contaminants, etc. Uh, and he's done work all around the world. So uh, very well known. We're very uh, fortunate to have him as a member of the Vancouver Aquarium team. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, welcome Dr. Peter Ross. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you all for coming out on a nice uh, evening in uh, Vancouver. As you can uh, imagine, the last week has been uh, nothing short of interesting for people like me who are concerned about ocean pollutants. Um, and I'll try to uh, uh, stay focused on the main goal this evening, which was to tell you a little bit about plastic. Um, but it's going to be hard to not digress completely. So what I've decided to do is to start a little bit generally and just ease everyone into the whole uh, concept of ocean pollution uh, and we'll see where that leads us. Um, ocean pollution is a catch-all term from really hundreds of thousands of different uh, contaminants out there. So uh, there are different ways of categorizing uh, pollutant threats or, uh, or uh, sort of uh, grouping them in ways that we understand or grouping them in ways that uh, managers or regulators can understand them. So uh, of course pollutants are coming from any one of a number of sources, from uh, industry, from automobiles, from uh, our, our, our use of pharmaceuticals. Uh, pesticides in the agroforestry sector, uh, oil, gas, etc. So many, many different sources around there. Um, and I like to think of three very broad or high-level uh, categories of contaminants or pollutants to the ocean. And here they are on the right. Biological pollutants, chemical pollutants, and structural pollutants. So biological pollutants I'm really not talking about very much tonight, but important that we recognize that there are viruses and bacteria pathogens out there that can uh, be released through agricultural uh, means, i.e. livestock or chickens and get into our waterways, uh, or um, our dogs on the beach are a big source of uh, fecal coliform for, uh, for local waters. That is a concern. Um, in addition, we've got red tides. We've got these paralytic, paralytic uh, shellfish poison uh, events, etc., related to uh, blooms of algae. And often this is uh, when the temperatures are warmer in the summer. Sometimes it's accentuated by nutrients. So we see um, blooms of very toxic algae in around um, Gulf of Mexico at the uh, delta uh, of the Mississippi River. Uh, so these are another concern that you may have heard about. So I'm not really going to talk about those uh, the that I consider uh, or I call uh, biological pollutants. Chemical pollutants, this is what most of us think about when we think about pollutants. Uh, chemicals, of course, uh, can be natural or man-made, uh, i.e. anthropogenic uh, contaminants, but there are often baseline contaminant levels out there for the non-man-made chemicals, and these would be things like metals. Uh, mercury is a natural element. It's a metal that's out there. Uh, 
So we will find it uh, geologically, but we'll also see it increase because of human activity. So that's, that's a, an example of a contaminant that we may be exacerbating or we may be um, uh, creating a situation where a, a previous um, situation was not a problem, but because of our activities, it has become a problem. So we've got these sort of natural geological um, elements that become contaminants or become pollutants and become harmful. Uh, we've also got hydrocarbons, ash, smoke, etc., that could come from volcanoes or forest fires. In fact, uh, did you know that dioxins and furans can be byproducts of volcanic activity or uh, of forest fires? So, so we have natural processes that can uh, create uh, a lot of nasty chemicals, uh, but these can also be exacerbated. Uh, through activities in our homes and industry. Uh, we, we burn a lot of things that can create smoke and particulate and ash and dioxins and furans. It can liberate all sorts of other industrial chemicals uh, that were not destroyed by that uh, incineration. Uh, typically we need uh, temperatures above about a thousand degrees Celsius to destroy the, the really uh, solid industrial chemicals like PCBs. So that's why we have um, a specialized uh, approach to incineration. Uh, for us in Vancouver, we have to ship things to Swan Hills in northern Alberta, uh, and that's where a high temperature incinerator destroys toxic uh, uh, chemicals uh, like the PCBs. Normal municipal incinerators will not destroy these chemicals, so they often mobilize those into the atmosphere. Hence, a little bit of concern about strategies around, uh, well, obviously all forms of waste management, but that would be one of them. Uh, toxic chemicals, I did mention dioxins of furans, a uh, big issue in, uh, in uh, British Columbia and elsewhere in the, in the world uh, around the formation of dioxins and furans with uh, uh, the use of liquid chlorine as a bleaching agent for uh, in craft mills, so pulp and paper mills. And that was discovered, it was a huge problem, uh, and that led to regulations. And we've seen, since seen dramatic reductions in the release of dioxins and furans into our coastal waters. And that's important and that's good. Um, good that we've seen that recovery. Um, so lots of these contaminants uh, we see in and around our coastal zone, but they're also, uh, a lot of these contaminants are transported with impunity around the world through atmospheric processes, through ocean currents, and through biological migrations. Uh, in the case of uh, any atmospheric pollutants coming from Asia, with the prevailing winds, uh, we have a number of studies that would indicate uh, that it only takes five or seven or 10 days for smoke, dust, metals, pesticides, industrial chemicals, uh, et cetera, to uh, be delivered to our coastline from Asia. So remember that, five to 10 days, that's, uh, that's a conveyor belt that is problematic, uh, of course, because that uh, has the potential to import chemicals into our environment that would otherwise not be here. So we've got a situation where, where we, we can worry about, document, and look at local issues, local contaminants, local sources, and we can try to regulate, manage, uh, or, or remove that uh, as, a, as a potential threat. But we also have to recognize that we have partners in our global marketplace that are also uh, sources of contaminants for our coastline. So there's, I, I, I like to think of the local versus global approach to documenting uh, and then hence uh, communicating with, uh, with regulators, managers, policymakers, et cetera. Structural pollutants, that's really where I want to head tonight. Uh, I, this uh, term, I've, I've kind of invented it because uh, there, there is really no good name for debris and plastics and garbage and, and ghost nets out there that are uh, potentially um, problematic or uh, to some wildlife or are in fact quite problematic to some wildlife. So these are pollutants that can uh, tangle, entangle, smother, drown, obstruct uh, the gastrointestinal uh, uh, system of all sorts of different species. Uh, and this is what I want to speak to tonight. And you can well imagine these, these structural pollutants, if you go down to the beach, you know what I'm talking about, is just anything that's, that's man-made on that beach or floating around the ocean. It could be a bottle, it could be a piece of discarded fishing net, it could be uh, an elastic band, uh, it could be a can, 
It could be a bottle cap, it could be a cigarette butt, uh, it could be just a chunk of uh, plastic that you just have no clue where it comes from. Uh, so any of these things can be a real problem, uh, and we know this uh, from, we've known this for several decades, and I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, when we look at the waters around Vancouver or southern uh, Vancouver Island or the transboundary Salish Sea, we're talking about a watershed that is shared by almost 8 million people. We have 8 million people living around the Strait of Georgia, Juan de Fuca Strait, and Puget Sound. 8 million people. This is local uh, habitat for the southern resident killer whales. And most of you know that there are fewer than 80 southern resident killer whales. Uh, these are long-lived animals, large habitat needs, uh, significant conservation concerns. They're listed as endangered under the terms of the Species at Risk Act in Canada. They're listed as endangered across the dotted line in the U.S. under the Endangered Species Act. 80 whales for 8 million people. That's 100,000 people for every whale. So if you think of every person flushing the toilet three, four, or five times a day with hormones, pharmaceuticals, or cleaning agents, if we're cleaning uh, around the kitchen or bathroom, ultimately that's going to end up in local, what I call local killer whale habitat. Uh, so we've got to be aware of this, and I think most of us are aware of this. But when we th start thinking about the Salish Sea and the watershed, which means the terrestrial environment, streams, rivers, lakes uh, that lead into uh, this, the, the local Salish Sea, then really what we're talking about is habitat for these killer whales. And remember, when you think about habitat for these killer whales, you're not just talking about the ocean. Why is that? Because habitat to these killer whales is what they eat. They are swimming around the ocean not because they can swim in the ocean, but because that's a place where they hunt, they forage, they find their food, and their preferred food is Chinook salmon, exactly. Long-lived, four to seven years, up to 50 kilograms, very nutritious. And where is Chinook salmon habitat? It straddles fresh water, estuarine, salt water, out into the open Pacific Ocean and, and back. Uh, anadromous fish are a real challenge for any managers or anybody who's trying to protect uh, that resource because it means you're, you're going across uh, governmental jurisdictions, of course, and that's, that's a bit problematic. Uh, and anadromous fish are passing by pulp mills and cities and farms, uh, sewage outfalls, uh, pulp mills, uh, ships, uh, you name it, a lot of, uh, lot of potential sources of, of uh, problematic contaminants. And Chinook salmon habitat in any one of those uh, bodies of water is also very, very important to a, a highly skilled predator that is relying on an abundance of Chinook. And that abundance is, at, is uh, in jeopardy right now because of climate change, habitat destruction, uh, fishing pressures by us, uh, and others. So uh, being on top of what killer whales eat, very important. And when we look around us, we start to look at local killer whale habitat quality. For someone like me who's concerned about pollution, one of the things we look for is mud. Most ocean pollutants end up in mud. They're ending up dropping out in the sediments. Why is that? Because they're either heavy or they are what we call particle active. They, they attached to particles and sediment out. So we can look at sediment samples from throughout the Strait of Georgia. On the left in red, you've got the old PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. You probably remember them. You, you uh, of course, uh, probably also know them to be legacy compounds. They were banned in Canada in 1976. PBDEs on the right you may have heard about. These are the flame retardants that, uh, that were very widely used uh, from about 1980 until uh, quite recently. Three categories of chemicals within the PBDE class. They're just now being phased out in Canada and the States, and they're very, very similar to PCBs. But what you're noticing here is simply a color-coded scheme that's reflecting the sediment concentrations of these two important classes of chemicals based on samplings that we carried out at depth throughout these, uh, this body of water. So you can see the hot spots there, not surprisingly, around cities such as Victoria and Vancouver. Uh, and you might notice also up uh, the Strait of, northern Strait of Georgia, a bit of a hot spot up there. We're not 
too sure right now whether that represents or reflects a bit of a localized source, but we suspect that actually part of the, the explanation for this is because there's less of a sedimentation rate. There's about half the sedimentation and burial rate uh, that we see down in the southern strait of Georgia. So that means uh, the contaminated sediments are not getting buried as quickly, which is what we hope will happen over time. Basically, that is a, a, an important part of waste management is just seeing things get buried. And if you actually look down here in the southern strait of Georgia at the mouth of the Fraser Estuary, you see quite low concentrations of PCBs. And that is more than likely uh, a reflection of the, the, uh, the extensive sedimentation around uh, the Fraser Estuary from glacial uh, till that's coming down the river. Whereas with the PBDEs, you're still seeing quite high levels associated with our recent activity of this, uh, more of a, a recent uh, concern in terms of uh, chemical contaminants. I mentioned sediments as a sink but they're all also a potential source. So remember, we're talking about pollutants that could be released through the atmosphere, through river discharge or point source discharge right into the ocean. And in simple terms, we're gonna see some loss into the air. You'll see some evaporation. You'll also see some deposition, potentially from Asia, as just discussed. You'll see sedimentation and burial, which, as I mentioned, for, uh, for many contaminants, that's what we really hope, uh, and, and hope for and count on, because anything that's leaving uh, our uh, various pollutant sources, we, we, we want it to be processed uh, in the receiving environment. The other thing that can happen with many types of persistent or, or uh, fat-soluble or pa particle-active compounds, we'll see this amplification in the food web. And that's where we see uh, creatures like killer whales uh, accumulating very high levels of things like PCBs, DDT, PBDEs, a lot of these persistent organic pollutants. And that's why Canada and the international community uh, have a treaty, it's called Stockholm Convention, to ban the persistent organic pollutants, or at least the most important ones. There is, there is an important regulatory structure within Canada uh, and a treaty internationally to address the particular vulnerability of these high trophic level uh, creatures. Oil is another uh, visible threat to uh, uh, particularly marine mammals and seabirds, very visible, charismatic creatures, of course. It makes for terrible news when you get uh, pictures like this. Uh, this is from the Deepwater Horizon uh, uh, accident in, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, and so is this with, with uh, dolphins. Uh, that's Deepwater Horizon, and this is a sea otter uh, up in uh, Prince William Sound in 1989, but 4,000 sea otters died, and, and you know, furred animals are very vulnerable, especially when you spend two to four hours a day grooming. You're, you're licking up a lot of that fur uh, that you rely on for insulation, and you're ingesting that. So, so these are terrible images for the media, very powerful and, and uh, very evocative. Um, you've seen the, some of the press over the last week. Uh, nobody likes to see that. Uh, and, uh, and yet, what we, what a lot of what lies behind the scenes are, is a lot of the invisible aspects related to this kind of uh, pollution. Uh, and that could be uh, fish, invertebrates, uh, you know, eelgrass, some of the sediments that provide habitat for lots of different uh, species, phytoplankton, zooplankton. So a lot of things that are less charismatic are not really being reported on in the media, but that is habitat nonetheless for dolphins, otters, uh, seabirds, uh, turtles, uh, salmon. Uh, eagles, um, seals, etc. So, uh, so there's a lot that we hear, but there are other things that we don't hear. And the other thing that's important to recognize is that we have lingering effects associated with the Prince William Sound uh, accident with the Exxon Valdez um, to this day. So long-term consequences associated with a major oil spill. Um, and they continue to find pockets of unweathered uh, oil, that means it's, it, has, it retains its original composition, uh, and that's over a period of uh, over 25 years, uh, and some lingering effects to, to salmon, to some seabirds, uh, and to some uh, marine mammals. So we, we now recognize that major oil spills can have very, very long-lasting consequences indeed. So let's talk about uh, the recent spill, just briefly, because I think uh, it's on everyone's minds, and maybe it, maybe it can serve to uh, provide a little bit of a backdrop for what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, the uh, the Marathasa uh, was on its maiden voyage, brand new ship. Uh, 
of course, in 1912, there was another maiden voyage of another ship, and uh, that ended off up on the other side of Canada. We, we heard about that one. We continue to hear about that one. But this one was anchored in, um, in English Bay in, in, Victor in uh, Vancouver, uh, and uh, there was a spill, uh, and there are a couple of images here. This is just at Lumberman's Arch, where the beach was closed. All the beaches around Stanley Park were closed uh, after a while. These are the booms uh, around the vessel uh, the day after the, uh, the spill was detected. Detected. And you can see here the, the pretty incredible um, imagery associated with the sheen and the slick um, that, uh, that uh, points right back to the vessel in question. So um, everyone has heard uh, varying reports on what happened. Uh, just in very simple terms or brief terms, uh, this is what we know or what we think we know. Uh, number one, about 3,000 liters of oil is estimated to have been released. Uh, let's call that a conservative estimate. That estimate comes from the Transport Canada overflights that were only carried out 24 hours after the spill first started, uh, and it's based on estimates of the, uh, the slick size uh, related to the thickness of that slick. So I think it's probably very conservative. It's probably more. Um, and then um, uh, uh, the, oops, sorry, the, um, the other estimate is that 80, to, you've heard this one, 80 to 90% of the oil has been recovered. Well, um, that's 80 to 90%, I believe, of the visible slick is gone. It doesn't necessarily mean you've recovered all the 80 to 90% of the oil. Um, so I think that's actually a bit of an overestimate. Some of that oil is subsurface now. Uh, there's little question of that. Some of it is diluted. A uh, very small amount will have evaporated. With, with Bunker C, we would expect five maybe 10% to evaporate over time. It, it's not a very, it doesn't have a lot of volatile uh, constituents. So we're going to expect this oil to, to fractionate or separate out through to the air, the surface of the ocean, suspension in the water column, or to sink down into the sediments. And if you think about all of this, what it means is we've got a wide spectrum, a complex mixture that is partitioning across habitats for different creatures. If you are a seabird and you're swimming along the, the top of the ocean or you're, you're a duck, uh, obviously the floating oil is a problem. But many seabirds will dive down to, uh, to uh, uh, fish for, um, for invertebrates or plants, depending on the species uh, that are attached uh, to the sediments. Um, so depending on who you are, whether you're a fish, uh, a bird, a marine mammal, um, an invertebrate uh, of sorts, um, you are going to be exposed to different risks associated with uh, contaminants in, of different, uh, of different um, degrees of complexity. Uh, at this stage, Estimates for uh, oiled seabirds, a little bit difficult to come by. Uh, we hear today of, uh, of a number, uh, around 30 uh, individuals, but many of these, because they're, they're flying around, swimming around, they're, they're very mobile, they have been hard to catch. Um, uh, the estimate uh, is probably off a little bit. No marine mammals uh, to speak of that, uh, that we know about, uh, although three killer whales were spotted nearby. And of course, there are harbor seals and sea, lion, sea lions uh, nearby. Harbor porpoises uh, uh, come into our waters occasionally and other species of cetaceans, et cetera. So uh, knock on wood, uh, we, we don't believe that marine mammals were directly uh, affected by this. Uh, there are river otters that have a very good marine existence in around Stanley Park and, and Vancouver Harbor. Um, there, there's some potential risk associated with their consumption of uh, invertebrates, of course, as well. So big questions still remaining about uh, some of the other non-charismatic creatures that I was mentioning before. Uh, here at the aquarium, uh, we, we had a busy week. Um, we immediately responded because uh, we were very close to what was going on. We had some particular skills to, to offer and some particular concerns. Uh, several teams were uh, put on standby representing rescue, rehabilitation, impact assessment, monitoring. Uh, we carried out beach surveys for oil. Uh, we had marine mammal rescue and rehabilitation teams ready. Uh, there were marine mammal observations led by Lance Barrett Leonard in English Bay and Burrard Inlet. Uh, we collected uh, and analyzed a number of environmental samples uh, and data are coming in now. We looked, uh, we, we had divers look at the water uh, intake around uh, the Vancouver Aquarium's water supply uh, after we observed oil on shore sheen offshore and smelled fumes uh, and saw uh, droplets of oil in around our water takes on the Thursday and Friday. And we've also been working uh, with 
varying degrees of uh, effect with officials that have been re responding to this uh, at the federal uh, level. This is Carmen uh, Morales, uh, she's in the audience here, and Marie Noel is also in the audience. They were, uh, they've both been uh, front and center in terms of uh, getting samples collected uh, getting beaches uh, surveyed and getting these samples into uh, high quality laboratories uh, to get the results. You'll see here, this is the high tide line at Second Beach. Uh, you'll notice this black uh, uh, line uh, across this boulder. These are, of course, barnacles. Barnacles don't usually feature on the front page of the Vancouver Sun. Uh, it's usually a duck or a seal or something more interesting. But you'll notice that thousands of them have been oiled here, and they will not be surviving. So, you know, direct impact. Uh, our human valuation of barnacles, not terribly high. Uh, nonetheless, what we see is a shoreline impact uh, that is very, very uh, clear to, uh, to think about uh, with those uh, visuals. Um, in in summary, what we're seeing is a modest spill, and this is where I, I, I do the big phew. It really was. We were very, very fortunate here. I mean, some people find that a little bit frivolous, a little bit light, but no, we were very, very lucky. It was calm, it was sunny, there was no wind, no chop, at least for the first 24 hours out there. Uh, you could not get an easier place or time uh, or weather uh, situation to clean up uh, this kind of an event. And it was right, uh, right adjacent to the first responders, so no better place for this type of accident. Uh, and uh, therefore, Therefore, because it was so close to, uh, to the city of Vancouver, represents, uh, this incident represents a potent reminder of the risks associated with uh, any kind of accident involving shipping or pipelines, for that matter, in coastal waters. It really means that we, uh, we, we have to be careful. We have to deal with best practices. We have to uh, uh, ensure that the proper regulations are uh, in place and uh, enforced. And we also uh, have to make sure that we're monitoring because with ocean pollution, uh, this is a file that, ha that, that has emerged as a significant gap in Canadian coastal waters. Uh, and it's making it very, very difficult for, uh, for the authorities in, in responding to this incident to assemble teams of experts because most of the experts have been disbanded. And we lack any kind of comprehensive uh, or regimented monitoring program that allows us to draw on that expertise, draw on the understanding of the resources at risk, and to monitor impact and or recovery associated with this accident. We are in very, very weak stand in that regard. Uh, and actually, um, I'll put in a little plug for our capacity here at the Ocean Pollution Research Program and our new Coastal Ocean Research Institute. This is the reason we set this, uh, this um, up at the Vancouver Aquarium because we feel there's a very distinct need to have baseline studies looking at uh, some of uh, humankind's uh, impacts on local waters and looking at some of the natural creatures that we value here. And these are just two plots, don't worry about it, it's just sign signatures or fingerprints for hydrocarbons uh, in sediments based on studies we published uh, about uh, eight years, well actually not that long ago. We published it in 2011, the samples were from a little bit uh, before that. This is uh, Burrard Inlet here, uh, this is on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, and, yeah, West Coast of Vancouver Island, most of those. So, so there's some baseline uh, data available from some of the research I was involved in uh, with graduate students, in this case, uh, Kate Harris, uh, historically. Uh, and that kind of baseline helps to inform a spill response. For example, if we know what the signature is in Burrard Inlet before the spill, then we're able to determine the extent to which that, uh, that impact uh, has uh, changed things after a spill. So that's really, really important if we're trying to assess the impact associated with a spill. It's also important uh, in terms of basically understanding where the, where the sources uh, and influences of multiple uh, activities are, because we have lots of sources of, excuse me, of uh, hydrocarbons in and around Vancouver. So when you have so many sources, really important to understand, document, track, and monitor. Can't stress enough. So hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons. We're thinking about plastics here uh, today. I'm going to make this uh, segue into some of the other hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are what we use in large measure to produce uh, all sorts of different plastic products. And basically we're talking about synthetic or organic com uh, compounds that form solid uh, products of variable uh, plasticity. And really plastic is a term that means that 
we can move that product a little bit. It's, it's simply a definition that reflects the, the physical properties of, of the product. There are many, many different uh, recipes for plastics uh, out there, uh, and, but most of them are based on petrochemical uh, products, petrochemical, uh, so oils, um, and, um, and uh, basically the, the, uh, the, the plastic that is produced uh, reflects the, the parent oil uh, and petrochemical product or compound or set of compounds that were used to make that product. But sometimes we add things to it. You've heard of BPA, bisphenol A. You've maybe heard of phthalate esters. These are either hardening agents or softening agents. Uh, and they're often added to plastic mixtures um, to uh, change their, uh, their plasticity. And as everyone knows here, plastic is everywhere. We live in a plastic world where I've heard estimates that the average human being every year consumes, in quotation marks, about four times their own body weight in plastic. So we are a plastic uh, species, uh, and the oceans are becoming plasticized as a result. Uh, of course, in some parts of the world, it's, it's really, really uh, disappointing to see uh, some of the uh, ways in which plastics are, are released uh, and end up on uh, beaches and shorelines and in, uh, in uh, seafood products occasionally. Uh, Kate Lasouf here provided me with this um, this uh, snapshot of the, uh, the tsunami debris cleanup on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So even in remote areas, we're seeing lots of plastics, not all related to the tsunami, of course. Uh, but when you're in, you have these catchment uh, bays that are exposed to uh, prevailing uh, winds and, and waves uh, from the west, you can often get accumulation of large quantities of plastic. Um, and uh, that can be uh, problematic for lots of reasons, but it can also be very difficult, very expensive, and quite dangerous to clean up. And uh, perhaps most perplexing of all is there is a never-ending source of these items out there floating around the ocean, and in fact, there seems to be more and more every single, single year. Um, with, uh, with the North Pacific, we've got about a seven or 8,000 kilometer fetch, uh, we've got prevailing uh, winds, we've got uh, various currents and gyres that will uh, either bring uh, this debris over to our coastline or uh, in the case of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is uh, about the size of France, I believe, floating around out there in the Pacific Ocean. This is a gyre that conspires to collect and retain uh, all these, uh, these uh, plastic items, uh, creating a real problem for our sea turtles albatross, and other uh, charismatic creatures that we know are impacted uh, by this debris. On the west coast of Vancouver Island, we have a particular case in point where we see sea lions getting entangled with lots of plastic. Uh, my colleague Wendy Sanislo uh, out in uh, Euclulet has been documenting this, uh, this problem and working with the Vancouver Aquarium on trying to, to understand uh, uh, where this is coming from and also trying to devise uh, mitigation methods or rescue methods to, to try to uh, address the, the origin of this problem and or to deal with the victims in some of these cases. So she's documented uh, using photo ID techniques at least 300 individual sea lions that are entangled in some way, shape, or form just in the Pacific Rim uh, National Park Reserve uh, on its own. So if you extend that estimate across uh, the, uh, the, the entire coast of British Columbia, you could probably multiply that by four or five times. We, might, we have well over a thousand uh, estimated sea lions with, with uh, swimming around with something around their necks. So what does this mean? Uh, where, where does this come from? In some cases, it's pretty obvious. You get uh, fishing lures that have been with the, uh, with the uh, hook that has been swallowed. Uh, that's uh, quite gruesome. Uh, but in other cases, a little bit more mysterious, you have these, these straps around the necks that as the animal swims or as the animal grows, that strap gets smaller and smaller or the neck gets bigger and bigger. Uh, regardless, you see this uh, ulceration uh, and um, this, uh, this laceration around the neck, which is very uh, troubling. Uh, and where do these things come, come from? Uh, Wendy's estimated that about 30% of these are packing straps. Uh, 
uh, 3% uh, are rubber bands, 15% fishing lures, uh, and uh, so a wide variety of different sources uh, and more on that as we go. We, we have to find out more about the origins of, uh, of these, uh, these straps in order to do something. And I should really point out that Dr. Dr. Marty Helena and colleagues at the Vancouver Aquarium and at Fisheries and Oceans, uh, together with Wendy, have been uh, leading efforts to rescue uh, some of the uh, worst afflicted, uh, afflicted uh, sea lions. Of course, only a handful. It takes a lot of people, a lot of effort, quite dangerous, uh, to deal with a single uh, entanglement. But a number of individuals have been rescued. And I, I understand that maybe on Friday, an elephant seal uh, is, uh, is the target of a, a planned uh, rescue. Um, so that's, uh, that's a small bit of good news. So once all of this plastic, all this debris is in the ocean, what do you do? It's kind of game over. Uh, the only thing you can really do is, is implement these shoreline cleanups, which, let's face it, uh, are, are uh, strategic, they're targeted, uh, but they are only a Band-Aid solution to a very wide problem. Does that mean that they're worthless? Absolutely not. These efforts will clean up locally. Uh, they are very important. They're pretty much the only thing we could do. But perhaps most importantly, uh, they are tremendously uh, valuable educational tools. These are ways to engage youth uh, and to uh, educate uh, children about the future of their ocean. And this is where we see energy uh, and excitement. And it's all wrapped around uh, the delight uh, and the pleasure that the kids glean from the ocean and their desire to protect the ocean. So I think the people here at the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup uh, will uh, testify to uh, just how important the cleanup uh, here uh, effort is in terms of uh, cleaning up pockets of contaminated beaches, but also engaging the public. Uh, just a summary, I believe this was from 2013. Kate will probably be able to correct me here. Uh, uh, this is data from the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, which has been uh, underway, I believe now, for 23 years. Um, and uh, so in Canada in 2013, almost 2,000 cleanup sites, over 3,000 kilometers uh, of uh, linear shoreline cleanup across the country. Almost 11,000 garbage bags filled, uh, 100,000 kilograms of garbage, and almost 60,000 Canadians. So that adds up in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, I think that uh, a lot, it, it provides an opportunity for individuals and communities to get involved in something to protect the ocean. And that, I think that's very important, not only from a, a debris and plastics perspective, but just from an ocean pollution perspective in general. When we're trying to figure out the source of these problems or the source of these products, because that is key to regulations or key to mitigation or key to best practices, we have to know where this trash, where this garbage is coming from. What do we do? Well, uh, most of you will know that in your blue bin, all of the items that you're recycling have a little number or have a little uh, code that will tell you what type of plastic it, it is. So that allows the recycling uh, uh, facilities uh, to actually sort uh, these plastic products and recycle them effectively. And that's very important because that becomes a new product somewhere else and it also very importantly, prevents the, the release or loss uh, of that uh, disposable item uh, before it heads into the ocean. However, in the ocean, most of these items do not retain that, that coating. Uh, you, will not, you will rarely see uh, on shards of plastic uh, the, the coating for the different types of recyclable plastics. And that's because of weathering of, of fragmentation, breaking down of the product. Uh, often you just can't recognize what you're getting. So there are other ways to try to categorize the different types of debris. And, and with the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, this is a summary of uh, some of the top ranked items in 2013. Not all of them are plastic, of course, but remember, plastic often floats. So it, it, we tend to see a, a dominance of plastic in these things. So cigarette filters, they're pretty high up there. 311,000 of them were, were picked up. That's not uh, insignificant. Uh, but you'll also see a lot of different types of, uh, of plastics. And many of these will not have that, that coating left on them because they're broken down, they're weathered. Uh, so it's difficult to understand where they're coming from. It gets more difficult to understand where these things are coming from when those products break down into microscopic particles. I'm going to talk about two microscopic 
particles here today. Um, and here they are, primary microplastics and secondary microplastics. The primary microplastics are the microbeads. Those are the abrasives and the scrubbing agents that we find in some toothpaste products uh, and in some facial scrubs. Uh, if you look, <laughs> my wife went to the dentist last week here in Vancouver, and apparently he's quite green, but th at the end of the appointment, he handed her two products. One was Teflon-coated dental floss. Teflon has no half-life. It doesn't break down. We find it in the liver of polar bears in the Canadian Arctic. It is now known to be quite toxic. So Teflon-coated dental floss was one free product my wife got from the dentist. The second thing uh, she got from the dentist was a bottle of toothpaste, or a tube of toothpaste. And one of the ingredients was polyethylene, which is plastic. That is a primary microplastic to scrub the teeth. And what do you do as soon as you brush your teeth? You spit out, you rinse, it goes down the sink, and then it's up to sewage treatment to deal with it. In some communities, there's no sewage treatment. So there's nothing retaining that. Or if we're retaining uh, sewage sludge where there is uh, primary, secondary sewage treatment, then that plastic, a lot of that plastic will be retained and will end up in, uh, as, a, as a fertilizer or possibly as, um, as landfill. So those are the primary microplastics, uh, fairly controversial these days and a number of bans, notably in U.S. states. Uh, but most of the major uh, companies uh, that produce, uh, that use microplastics or microbeads in uh, scrubs and toothpaste are in the process of planning for a, a phased withdrawal from market. So uh, it is on the horizon. Uh, there is an awareness at the corporate level of this. But really, you know, there's, there's not really a, a terrific reason to have microbeads uh, in toothpaste or facial scrubs. There, there are lots of other abrasives that can be used that are much less persistent and less harmful to the environment. Secondary microplastics, uh, a new mystery. These are really, these have been emerging as a uh, contaminant of concern. They first appeared in the scientific literature a couple of decades ago, but it's really been only the last five years where they've, uh, new research has really exploded and there are numerous groups around the world uh, studying uh, or trying to characterize the presence and extent and impacts associated with sec secondary microplastics. These are simply the breakdown products of larger items. So think about that beach walk when you're out at some remote bay on the west coast to Vancouver Island, and you, you found that bottle of soda, and it, it had the label on it, it had the, the little recycling symbol on it, you know what that is. Then think about uh, a shard of, of uh, a, a, an old plastic uh, bait box or, or something from the fishing sector. You go, well, it's plastic, I know that, but there's no label, no number. And then go get smaller and smaller until you get down to these secondary microplastics where you really don't have a clue what they came from. But based on uh, all of the research that's done, uh, you, you'll see different types uh, of uh, these microplastics or sec secondary microplastics. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of research right now trying to characterize uh, the different uh, compounds th that make up these uh, microplastics and where they might be coming from. Based on evidence in uh, Europe, uh, we're very worried about uh, household waste as well as industrial wastewater. Uh, there, there, there are a lot of indications, a lot of the, the fibrous uh, microplastics are in fact coming from laundry and, uh, and uh, household discharges. So this is, of course, a concern when you think about waste management and also uh, textiles. Uh, but there's also, uh, there are also a number of sources within the fishing uh, and shipping sectors uh, that we've, we've got to look to as well. So a lot of questions remaining as to where these things are coming from, but we are getting more and more examples uh, around the world of uh, where the putative sources are. We've carried out uh, two uh, full studies of microplastics in the northeastern Pacific. The first one uh, was uh, looking at subsurface seawater uh, in uh, collaboration with the uh, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and that's the John Tully, which is the, the large oceanographic research vessel that likes to go out here to Station Papa, Station P, the old weather station from World War II, uh, over 1,000 kilometers offshore. So it's been running transects uh, seasonally uh, for a long time, uh, and there's a lot of oceanographic data there. And we took the opportunity to collect seawater from the seawater intake for uh, the Tully, about uh, four meters below the surface of the sea, and we pumped 20 to 30 liters through sieves uh, and then 
uh, and then we collected that into vials uh, and then uh, uh, enumerated and characterized uh, anything we, we found in there. Um, and I'll mention uh, just how we did that in a second. And the second thing we did uh, using different cruises, but the same uh, study locations, is we, we collected zooplankton samples uh, together with uh, Moira Galbraith, who is a uh, zooplankton taxonomist that works with it for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And these zooplankton samples we used to look and see whether they had ingested any of these uh, plastic particles that we were looking for. So those are the two studies I'm going to speak to very briefly here. With seawater, we digested the, the water using acid to get rid of any organic material. Uh, when you look under the microscope uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, seawater or after 20 to 30 liters of seawater has been filtered, uh, it's pretty surprising what you'll find. There are a lot of uh, scary monster uh, <laughs> Scary monster parts from uh, zooplankton and uh, invertebrates. Uh, that's the theme, of course, here, uh, is these tiny little monsters. So there are little, little buggy eyes and antennae and, and feet and, and pieces of carapace. It's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty crazy. So we have to get rid of that. Uh, to, or if it's an antenna, we have to make sure it's an antenna, not a fiber of plastic. So acid digestion really helps there. And then a visual examination. It was a, a former graduate student of mine, uh, JP, uh, who, who went through and spent a lot of time, a lot of care, looking through the microscope uh, and developing the, the, the know-how to be able to, to, to figure out what was plastic and what was not. And so he looked at size, shape, color, and he also poked, prodded, and, and, and bent uh, each of the different uh, pieces to see whether it was plastic or not, whether it was malleable or not, and that was, that was also pretty important. Uh, uh, so, uh, so he had a lot of confidence about what was plastic versus what was not plastic. With the zooplankton, similar sort of thing, except in this case, in each vial of a glass uh, jar, we digested, using acid again, each zooplankton uh, individual. So we took a bug collected from somewhere out in the North uh, Pacific Ocean, and we added acid, and we heated it up until the bug disappeared. So that invertebrate uh, individual disappeared. The only thing left was plastic. So that's what we did for the invertebrates. And again, JP went through, counted, enumerated, characterized, uh, and described, and poked and prodded uh, to try to figure out whether it was plastic or not. Have a look at this sample from the Strait of Georgia. This is uh, a, a filter paper, look, uh, and you're looking at it through a dissecting scope, so this is uh, not that powerful of a microscope. And here's a millimeter here for the scale. And what you see is lots of different colors, uh, and you see a lot of uh, different shapes and sizes, but really there are two categories. One are uh, these little chunky bits, these are particles. That, that's probably broken down plastic bags, products, older things. They've been around a long time. They've been broken up by the surf, by the rocks, by the, by the sun, by the wave action, etc. And then the other are these fibers. So uh, these fibers, all sorts of different colors, hard to know what they are, but we suspect that that's coming from textiles. Right? So plastic te textiles, you can think about fleeces, that uh, is probably uh, uh, something that we should be uh, um, looking at and uh, trying to figure out whether that uh, may be, dis may be um, helping to explain the source of all these fibers. We were finding here in the Strait of Georgia an average about 3,000 to 4,000 particles per meter cubed of seawater. So 3,000, 4,000 particles per meter cubed of seawater. That drops down to just a couple of hundred offshore, but we still find them out 1,000 kilometers offshore. Pretty astounding. Uh, so you see that ramps up here in a more industrialized area with a couple of exceptions. Take a look at Queen Charlotte uh, Strait here. Very high levels, up at 9,000 particles per meter cubed. And we know from some other research that other uh, scientists have carried out um, that this is a bit of a, a catchment basin for debris coming in from the Pacific. The currents, the winds, the tides all conspire to kind of uh, funnel, channel, and, and collect larger debris items, garbage, visible garbage, in this area. Uh, so it may be an oceanographic phenomenon that actually serves to enhance and deliver uh, the supply of uh, all sorts of plastics, and in this case, microplastics. So really, they're everywhere. They are everywhere once you start looking. 
In terms of the zooplankton, uh, we, we, uh, we looked at two species, Neocalinus uh, cristata and Euphausia pacifica. These are two very important uh, species from a food web perspective and in the North Pacific. Very important, uh, low level in the food chain. Very important food for fish. All right, and what do we see? We see uh, the highest uh, encounter rates uh, for uh, zooplankton in the Strait of Georgia here. Uh, for uh, the Neocalinus uh, species, and then the Euphausid, uh, the highest levels in the Strait of Georgia, but also that North Island area sort of around uh, Queen Charlotte Strait. So what this means is these species are ingesting plastic. They are seeing this stuff in the water column and they're mistaking it for food and they're chowing down. And uh, if we look at the numbers, um, a little bit hard to tell just how significant this is. But basically, we took the concentration and we said, okay, let's change the way in which we describe that. And what we did for Neocalinus, we said, for every 38 individuals that we looked at, there was one piece of plastic. Okay, so one in every 38 individuals. Uh, for Euphausids, it was one in every 17 individuals. One in every 17. But when you think of the billions and trillions of these, uh, these uh, copepods uh, and uh, euphausids out there, uh, this is going to start to add up. And then we had interesting differences in the frequency and also the size of plastic ingested by the two species. Uh, and in the case of the euphausids, they seem to have a preference for the fibers. So it starts to tell us something about their, uh, the way in which they feed, the, the way in which they graze, the way in which they, um, they accumulate uh, different types of plastic. So these results start to uh, present us with some uh, questions. Some of them, I think, are important. Uh, many of them are tractable. These are, these are questions that we can answer with monitoring, with research, with lab-based study, with field studies. Uh, but if we don't look, we're not going to find out. Uh, and fortunately, there are a lot of people around the world that are, uh, who are looking right now. Uh, but some of the questions are, from a marine mammal or from a charismatic species perspective, where are these straps and nets coming from that are entangling these sea lions? If we can find out that source, we may be able to very easily turn the tap off and pre prevent some pretty uh, awful suffering uh, in the form of uh, what these uh, straps and nets are doing to these sea lions. Where are the microplastics coming from that we're finding in seawater? That's going to take a little bit more sleuthing, but uh, I think there, there are some indications out there and there are some uh, studies that, be, that can be carried out to help shed light on there. Because in the absence of that kind of mechanistic source identification, we're we're just going to speculate. We're simply not going to know. Once we know, we can refine the answers. We can deliver more appropriate uh, advice to regulators, managers, engineers. Uh, we can talk about uh, product design or engineering, all those sorts of things. But when we're speculating, it becomes a much more difficult conversation. So again, research and monitoring is well positioned to answer some of those questions. And then finally, uh, interestingly, um, do these microplastics present a similar threat to small creatures at the bottom of the food chain that the big uh, pieces of plastic and nets present at the top of the food chain. So when we look at the sea lions that are entangled or the turtles that are ingesting plastic bags thinking they're jellyfish, and then we look at these copepods at the bottom of the food chain uh, feeding on these tiny little particles of uh, fleecy or fishing line or whatever it is that they are ingesting, then we start to see a commonality with regard to the potential impact associated with plastics. Plastics have the potential right now to be affecting all sorts of, uh, of uh, sea life at the bottom of the food chain, middle of the food chain, and at the top of the food chain. So that's a bit of a troubling conservation question because when we look at charismatic creatures that are endangered or for which there's conservation concern, or when we look at seafood and the health of our salmon stocks, we want to make sure that uh, we can do this kind of science in a way that informs uh, positive change and mitigation at the end of the day. And finally, a bit of an editorial note here. I think some of us struggle. Um, I struggle a little bit as a scientist because when I do my research, I like to have it meaningful and relevant. I like to be able to package it up and deliver it to the authorities or the agencies that can then turn around and do something about that. And I think we often uh, uh, rely or, or like to think we can rely on regulators and managers. The problem is that regulators and managers are overworked. 
they're taxed in terms of uh, their ability to perform uh, uh, in this uh, sector these days. And there's simply put, there's less appetite for a regulatory top-down approach. And I think this is where we have to recognize that we're, we're experiencing a phase shift in which our society is confronting uh, these problems. And that means that we need a phase shift uh, in society and coming to terms with the fact that there, there has to be another way to come up with solutions to protect the ocean. And I think shoreline cleanup efforts are, are a symptom of that. We've got kids that are engaged. Uh, we have uh, green design. We do have regulations, of course, but they're not the only thing out there. We have best practices by industry, uh, by, uh, by stewardship groups, and of course we have consumer choices. We vote with our pocketbook. So I think uh, when, we, when we look at the plastic problem of any shape, size, color in the ocean and implications for uh, the health of sea life, we have to realize that the answer is not necessarily going to be a top-down regulatory approach, but really it involves each one of us in this room. Uh, lots of uh, links that I could give you, but I want to highlight a couple here tonight. First one here is you can uh, visit uh, Tanya here, who's an employee uh, of the Vancouver Aquarium, and she's decided to live a year of her life plastic-free. And she's found that to be quite a challenge. Follow her blog, a remarkable story. Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, you've heard a lot about this today. Kate is in the audience today, she can tell you all about that, but lots of information online. Uh, my research program uh, with Carmen here in the audience, uh, we are setting up a coastal uh, pollution watch project as well as a number of effort, other efforts to do that research and monitoring in support of anybody who wants to use that. I'd like to showcase also one, uh, one non-governmental organization with uh, an excellent suite of programs, Georgia Strait Alliance. They have Clean Marine BC as well as a number of other efforts to try to uh, maintain a healthy, vibrant uh, Strait of Georgia. Uh, and this Clean Marine BC is an excellent uh, toolbox uh, for boat owners uh, to, uh, to do that. So thank you for your time. This is what it's all about. It's all about keeping healthy wildlife going in our uh, coastal waters uh, and traditional seafoods for Aboriginal uh, communities and of course seafood for uh, everyone out there. We're, we're trying to keep the, the ocean clean uh, and we have some work to do but I'm also very enthusiastic about um, the way in which all sorts of citizens, uh, small and tall, uh, like to get involved, and I think that's the conversation we have to really continue to build on. So thanks for your time, thanks for coming out uh, this evening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, so let's go ahead and take some questions from our audience. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, great. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering the crab seal population, could the decline in that be an effect of bioaccumulation and not maybe just lack of a food source? Could they be picking up microfibers, plastics? Is there any tissue sample stuff being done? The decline in which populations are? The crab seal population. Crab seal? Crab eater seal in Antarctica? Yeah, the one that's micro-filter teeth, you know, the filter yeah. feeder almost. Um, I, we don't have any idea. There's no studies that I know of that have really looked at impact of microplastics on uh, marine mammals. We do know that some whales wash ashore. Uh, we've, had, uh, anecdote, well, we've had individual reports from gray whales in Washington State, uh, from uh, killer whales uh, up in the, the northeastern Pacific, uh, a little bit further north, um, where the individuals washed ashore with stomachs full of fishing lures or, or, or different items. I think in, in Puget Sound there was a fisherman's boot, a golf ball, rain pants found in a gray whale. Of course, gray whales are eating mud. They're really uh, down there in the sediment. So there are lots of roots. Uh, and I, I think if we look at any marine mammal species, we're going to find plastics of some size, shape, or form. Um, the, 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 the question, though, is from a risk perspective, is twofold. Is one, is the animal capable of passing that, which is a reflection of size of the, the debris item with, uh, versus the size of the gastrointestinal tract. The second is, does that item um, 
release any uh, uh, plastic uh, compounds or additive chemicals uh, or sorbed uh, contaminants uh, that are then taken up by by that individual. And the latter, well, both have been have been demonstrated, but it's it's a little bit difficult with the smaller plastic items to show uh, real impact for the for the bigger species. I think really we're talking about, about a problem that is probably more significant for the smaller species in the ocean. I was wondering if the microfibers could penetrate tissue at all, if they might be you know, going straight. Did you hear that? Yeah. So uh, do the microfibers penetrate tissue? Excellent question. We know that filter feeders, like, like uh, some, uh, a lot of the shellfish, uh, do retain uh, plastic fibers. There, there was a study in Europe showing that in the aquaculture sector that uh, mussels were uh, filtering out a lot of the fibers from the associated uh, industry or the adjacent in industry. Uh, so I think there are, there's a lot of interest in, in uh, trying to document uh, the extent to which uh, shellfish might be ingesting these and does that then become a risk for humans that are consuming that. Um, so, uh, so some species of animals will retain, others I, I don't, I, I suspect not so much because a lot of the bigger creatures that are eating, uh, that are potentially exposed to microplastics are probably also eating fish, whole fish with bones and scales and teeth and all sorts of things. So I think that the mammalian system is, is pretty good at, at protecting the gastrointestinal wall against these sorts of things. Probably a bigger risk for the bigger, sharper objects that may cut uh, and um, you might have seen the pictures uh, taken by the uh, local fishermen with, um, uh, with the trout uh, returning to, um, to the Vetter River about two months ago where the salmon had uh, a stomach full of uh, plastics and that had actually uh, lacerated and cut through the stomach in several places and there were some infections. So clearly that's, uh, that's something to be worried about. I know my kids are watching and are pretty stoked to hear that they don't have to brush their teeth anymore because they'll be protecting aquatic life if they don't spit the toothpaste down the drain. Do you have any recommendations for maybe a microplastic free facial products or toothpaste or anything like that? Well, I was thinking about opening up my own uh, sideline uh, to finance our research program, but uh, no, there, there are plenty of products out there. In fact, uh, it's only a, a minority of the products out there that uh, have uh, microbeads in them. So just read the label uh, or be a good critical consumer. You know, if you've got toothpaste at home or you've got a facial scrub at home and, and it has microbeads in it, you'll notice that. You'll know that. Uh, there are tens of thousands of these in each tube. So be aware of that and just make some wide, wise consumption uh, uh, choices. Uh, there are apps uh, for iPhone uh, from an organization in the Netherlands. Uh, it's called uh, Ban the microbead, I believe. Ban the microbead? Beat the microbead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, and you can go and scan the UPC code on the product, and it'll tell you whether it has uh, microbeads or not in it. I don't know if it works in, in the Canadian UPC codes, but there, there, there are enabling tools to, to make yourself a better consumer. There are other apps that will tell you whether the product you're about to buy has harmful chemicals. They might be endocrine disrupting for example, they're, uh, or they might be problematic to the aquatic environment. So we can, we, we can, uh, we can garner some strength, some uh, educational support for our consumption. I know it's, it's, a, it's a big, scary world out there in, in the pharmacy or in the, in the, in the uh, supermarket, but there are tools. And you know, if you're a consumer like me, it's not like you buy 20 different brands of toothpaste a year. You, you find one you like, you do the research, and you like it, stick with it, you're good. All right, great. Do we have some more questions here in our audience tonight? Yep, right up here. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to uh, know if you could talk a little bit about <clears throat> out in mid-ocean of the Pacific, where they find these uh, large plastic uh, uh, miles of plastics that are kind of uh, at the uh, center of the Pacific Ocean and what research is being done on that and if there's anything internationally being done to address that? Yeah, so uh, you're talking about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. There are many gyres around the world where we get this, this, these collection uh, uh, gyres uh, for plastics and other debris. Um, so people are studying uh, these gyres. Uh, they are documenting encounter rates. Uh, 
Uh, some people are, are either uh, trying to uh, mitigate or clean up or are proposing to clean up. There are a number of initiatives around the world with technologies, uh, robotic technologies that are proposed to go out and, and collect things. Um, end of the day, if we don't turn off the tap, it's going to be a never-ending um, challenge. Uh, the other challenge, of course, is with the water column. Uh, we're finding uh, microplastics uh, down right to the sediments uh, in the ocean. Uh, so they're pretty much they're in three-dimensional space uh, in addition to floating. Uh, but certainly, Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a cartoonesque uh, example of just what goes wrong when. Uh, when one does not watch out. I should point out one other thing. The International Maritime Organization uh, dealt with this in, in treaty form, I believe in 1991, when ship-based uh, um, garbage disposal was banned. So uh, in the old days, navies, fishing boats, cruise ships, freighters, they all just cut open the garbage bag, I remember seeing it, and they'd let the garbage off the, the stern of the ship out, out in the ocean. So that used to happen extensively. And then we started getting a lot of stuff washing up on, the, on popular shores of North America and Europe, uh, and that was banned. So that was, that was a very important step, uh, and we saw some recovery uh, in, in remote beach uh, surveys uh, after that. But now we're, we're kind of seeing just, I think, the cumulative effects of uh, consumption and the increased uh, sort of application of different plastic uh, polymers to different products. Any more questions? We've got one right over here. Okay, I hope you're right there. Um, are there any indicator species that you're using to monitor the long-term plastic situation? So indicator species for long-term plastic uh, accumulation. Um, we, we, we are we're trying to figure that one out. Uh, seawater is a pretty decent matrix to look at because uh, then we can, we can filter uh, large volumes of water, get it onto a filter, and, and then we can count and quantify. Um, the zooplankton, that was a pilot study, uh, and uh, so, but it's fairly labor intensive. You need the large oceanographic vessels. Uh, so uh, trying to devise a longer term uh, approach to things, uh, jury's still out. There are lots of people looking. Right now, I think the international scientific community is sort of picking and choosing depending on, on your favorite study animal, your favorite location, your favorite technique, and who you are, how you, how you were trained, and, and, uh, and who you work for. There, there are lots of different species that are being used. So I think we will see over the next five years uh, a number, uh, a handful of really key um, taxa, uh, taxa, so uh, species or, or genuses that, are, that, that will, will be used to, to monitor and track over time. But because microplastics are so complex, it's not like a PCB molecule or a mercury uh, atom. Uh, we're talking about a, a wide variety of chemicals. We're talking about uh, a, a, um, different sizes and shapes and densities, hence they're going to float or, or end up in different parts of the ocean depending on, on what they're made of. So fairly complicated. So it's very difficult to have a very simple uh, laboratory approach or research-based approach to target and monitor over time for that reason. That's why I think you're seeing a, a wide variety of different uh, types of studies being carried out today. And that'll probably take some time to settle out uh, in the scientific community. OK, um, I'd like to go ahead and um, share one of our online questions. So this is from uh, Peg via Facebook. Uh, do you have any information on the presence of microfibers from laundry effluent in creatures like shellfish? We have, uh, from my understanding, we have no uh, causal link between uh, uh, textiles uh, going from the, the home uh, to, through the sewage stream to shellfish that we consume. No, we don't, um, we don't have that, uh, the confidence to be able to speak to that. Certainly shellfish have been, uh, uh, have been studied and, uh, and fibers and particles are found in, in shellfish. Um, and I think uh, some, of, uh, some of those fibers have been associated or attributed to nets and, and ropes, probably marine uh, lines. Um, but the origin of these microplastics uh, is, is really difficult to ascertain with a lot of confidence simply because you don't, as I was describing in the talk, you don't get a label on that little fiber or that particle. So you have to use a number of different approaches to try, and to, try to figure out where it's coming from. Whether you're looking at, at patterns over space where you say, oh, these are the waters next to sewage treatment, these are the waters next to farm, these are waters next to industrial wastewater, uh, this is an agriculture installation, that would be one sort of line of evidence to 
to, to provide uh, guidance on that. And then the other is actually looking at the plastic polymers that are being retained or accumulated by these different species. And that's, that's a little bit challenging. There are several techniques that one can use in a, in a high-powered uh, chemistry lab to try to figure out what type of polymers are used. That's another line of evidence that you can use to try to figure out where these things came from. Um, I think I may have overheard some folks talking about a device that actually scans plastics and it can identify where they were produced. Is something like that, would that be beneficial to a program where you're trying to find where plastics are coming from? Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest needs that we have uh, in terms of understanding microplastics in the aquatic environment would be, uh, would be to acquire the capacity to do exactly that, and that is to fingerprint in some way, shape, or form the individual micro microplastic particles. And there are, there are a couple of major lines uh, of inquiry that can enable that, or instrumentation that can enable that, and that's the kind of instrument that one could use to, to help inform some of these uh, very good questions about where the heck are these microplastics coming from. And is that an instrument you just uh, pick up at the local Canadian Tire or do you need to buy that somewhere else? Yeah, it would probably be a little bit more costly than the average uh, machine that you would be buying at Canadian Tire, but we have a few ideas there. Okay, very good. So what I'm going to do is I, I wanted to just kind of um, uh, mentioned that uh, the ocean pollution program here at the Vancouver Aquarium is in its infancy and I believe we are uh, going to be raising some money or looking for some funds to get a machine where we can actually uh, look at where plastics are coming from. It, those are very expensive machines. So if you or anyone you know um, has come into uh, you know a few dollars and would like to donate that to the Coastal Ocean Research Institute or the Ocean Pollution Program, please do I that. Do. The Vancouver Aquarium is a nonprofit society. Um, we are dedicated to aquatic conservation. So you can pass that along to your friends uh, that have uh, deep pockets. Um, tonight's lecture was a part of the Sea Monsters Revealed lecture series. Uh, so we have a number of other lectures coming up. Uh, the next one will be uh, with Dr. Kate Moran from the Ocean Networks Canada. She'll be talking about creatures of the deep. Uh, I would like to invite anyone that's here tonight to uh, join us in the exhibit uh, adjacent to the theater. Uh, we have some drinks available and uh, we can visit with Dr. Peter Ross and ask further questions for anyone who has some uh, kind of deeper questions that they would like to get to tonight. And I'd like to thank our online audience for joining us as well. Um, and we hope to see you on April 29th for our next public program. Thank you very much and have a good night. Oh, thanks.